All right. For an episode I didn't even remember, that, that wasn't too bad. I was expecting some more, you know, season three. I mean, there's some nonsense here, and I don't want to say otherwise. It's just, yeah, okay. This was directed by Marvin Chomsky. He did, uh, uh, And the Children Shall Lead. And remember, he wasn't the bad director there. And Day of the Dove, which was some good stuff. And, of course, this is written by Jean... Eroeste? Eroeste? I do not know how to pronounce that. She did. In, she also did the episode, Is There in Truth No Beauty? This, um... I've, I've read the outline for this episode. It reminds me a lot of the Time Machine. You know, Wells. And no, no, no negative on that. But what I find really interesting is for an episode this late in Season 3, it almost feels like they were like, you know what, screw it. <laughs> Let's just do whatever, right? Which, if you sounds if that sounds familiar, there's several shows that did pretty much exactly that when it came to the fact that they knew they were canceled. You're probably thinking, ah, oh, Lord, they knew they were canceled. I'm not sure. I've actually tried to narrow down information on the exact time at which people were aware of the fact that Star Trek was officially canceled. I have to believe it was before now in production order because that's usually how that works. Like to give you a nice idea, when season four of Enterprise had started production. As in, when they first got into Season 4, they'd already decided not to renew for Season 5. So all of Season 4, they knew that, right? It just, just to name one example of that. Obviously, TNG, DS9, and Voyager all knew Season 7 was their final season, walking into it as well. So in this case, I'm just kind of... I don't know. I don't know when they found out. Either way, there are no ship shots in this episode. Nothing whatsoever on board the Enterprise. It's all... Uh, localized stuff. I'm not sure if they had pre-existing sets or what, but it feels like they spent a reasonable amount of, in, of money on this episode, which is kind of surprising. Either way. Uh, so, they go there and they find the librarian who has played, who's, who's Septimus from back in uh, Bread and Circuses, named Atos. That is spelled A-T-O-Z. A to Z. Ha, ha, ha. The librarian, uh, Miss Arioste uh, Jean, is also a, uh, a librarian at the UCPL, I think, at this point in history. So that that kind of makes sense. So the episode starts because they're examining these portals, and no one will explain anything to anyone, which is irritating. And finally, Kirk hears a voice and rushes through, and then McCoy and and, and you know Spock here, and they rush through. That's our premise. That's how this gets started. Really? Wow, okay. Either way, <clears throat> that's a little bit nonsense. Here's a question. Why does the portal stay open both ways? Actually, you know what? Let me rewind that. That makes a degree of sense. Because of something I'll get to a little bit later. Although I'm not sure why they designed it that way. As in, in-universe, why they designed it that way. So there's two concepts I want to talk about with you. One is time travel as a means of escape. That's kind of a weird and interesting thought, because it only makes sense from a personal perspective and not a societal one. If you think about it, there are plenty of points in history you can jump back in and just go and live your life, and as long as you are personally being careful about things and just living a life that is within that time period that you have chosen, then you're not really going to affect history in any substantial way, and thus you're just going to vanish into history. So that makes sense on a personal level. It does mean your species ends. You're gone. Because you, there was all of you, then you went back, the end, right? That's the end of it. And that's, that's the extent of how uh, your species goes. They do reach a terminus point when the star goes nova, and there's none of you left at this point in history, right? It's interesting to think about. Here's a question for you. If you were on Earth, and Earth's star is going nova, and the Federation doesn't exist, and doesn't help people who need you know, to be saved from novas anyways, as we saw back in the Empath, what era would you pick? Remember, you can get pretty specific. In fact, it looks like you could narrow it down to the point where you can ingrate yourself into almost whatever job you want, like the prosecutor did, for example. So where would you go for? Because it's a fascinating question, isn't it? Because remember, the objective here is don't change history, because if you do, everything's screwed up for everyone. So you have to find a time period where you can, which you're interested in, where you can find a role that you actually enjoy living in, while at the same time not making any major waves or impact on the history of your people. So, where do you pick and why and how? I know you're going to ask me that question. I'm not sure. 
I'd probably pick somewhere where I could die really easily because, frankly, I would not want to live in the past. I like indoor plumbing a little bit too much. But what would you pick if given the option? This leads to the second interesting concept in this episode. Time travel is a prison. Now you might think, oh my god, that's terrifyingly dangerous. Well, no, for the same reason. Because, you know, the exact way they use it in this episode makes perfect sense for a prison. You know, you think sending people to Australia is, is kind of a prison thing, or sending people out to the Caprulu sector. No, 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 no. You send people to the Ice Age. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Exactly. How are they going to change history? What are they going to affect that's going to cause any major drift? Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, because obviously there is that random chance, but you could probably say with reasonable certainty that sentencing someone to just go back and exist in the Ice Age is basically a death sentence. And even if they somehow lived, well, I mean, that's just them existing in the Ice Age for the next 30, 40, 80, whatever years, and it's the end of that, right? It's a very effective prison. What's really horrible is if you were very careful about it, and given their time tech being pretty high tech, I could see this, they might be able to go back and say, like, okay, so you're going to go back at, let's just make up a year, year 50 within the Ice Age. And then they're like, okay, well, they're gone. Now we have to sentence the next person. Scan for when that person died. Okay, it looks like they died in the year 53, pretty quick. So we're going to send you back at the year 53 plus a month. And you could space them out like that. So everyone's always there by themselves. No chance of unifying, no chance of breeding, no chance of screwing up the timeline. Because, And there's, there's like a however many thousand year gap there to do that in. So you got plenty of space, so to speak, and a whole lot of corpses that you're eventually generating, of course. And depending on the type of time travel that this is, those corpses may have already always been there, and they may not alter anything, and maybe you're just making branching narratives, and who cares? Branching timelines. Since nobody cares about that, right? Just an interesting concept, and really, really horrible, if I might be so bold. So Kirk, uh, Kirk and McCoy, that is to say Kirk and Spock and McCoy, the two groups, who do you think has it worse? I know that sounds like a weird question, but really think about this for a moment. McCoy and Spock are trapped in a cave by the environment. Like, that's what's keeping them there. They could leave at any time they want. It's just the, the cold and the death is all that awaits them, so there's nowhere to go. By contrast, Kirk is stuck in a cage, you know, limited by what he can physically reach and just with bars in front of him. Personally, I'd take the Ice Age over that one, but what do you think? Which one's worse? So Spock starts to go violent and emotional in the back backstory. I gotta share this. This is hysterical because I have a theory, a lore theory about this one. Uh, I have to rewind a second. I love that episode, says Fred Friedberger. The woman who wrote it was a librarian at UCLA. Oh, there you go, UCLA. I remember that when Leonard Nimoy read the script, he came to me and said, "I'm Vulcan. How can I be passionately in love with a woman and so emotional?" God, this is a weird sentence structure. I'm a Vulcan. How can I be passionately in love with a woman with emotion involved? So I said, this is way back in time, before the Vulcans had developed, had evolved into a non-emotional society. He accepted that, for which I was very grateful. One of my favorites. All right, here's the theory. Leonard Nimoy is like, well, hang on. How am I feeling emotion here? Leonard Nimoy get, then gets an astonishingly stupid answer that makes no sense on any level whatsoever. Leonard Nimoy then says, you know what, this is the second to last episode anyways, I don't care anymore, and then just drops it. <laughs> Remember, nobody really expected Trek to be a thing. In fact, uh, Paramount just tried, the only reason Paramount started running syndication tapes of these episodes, uh, of, of Star Trek in general, was because they were trying to recoup their losses on this failed show. And in so doing, inadvertently revealed more of the show to more people, which helped push the Trek phenomenon onwards. It is worth noting, though, that it could be argued that the Trek thing as a franchise wouldn't really be officially codified until Star Trek II. Because while the convention scene started in, I think, 75? Somewhere in the mid-70s was the first convention. So the convention st scene started going, which was extremely successful. And then they tried to get going with the animated series, which was not successful. And then they tried to get going with Phase 2, which didn't happen at all. And then they did the motion picture, which did not do particularly well, mostly because of behind-the-scenes problems. 
So what I'm trying to say is, even though there was definitely fan interest, Star Trek failed, succeeded with the convention, and then failed, and then failed, and then failed. If it wasn't for Wrath of Khan, we wouldn't have Trek now, most assuredly, because the money people would look at that and say, nope. But Wrath of Khan was a smash hit. Well, a creative hit, which led to a lot of more interest, which led to a lot more support, which led to Star Trek III, and most importantly, Star Trek IV, which was the actual smash hit, and Star Trek IV is why we have all of the stuff we have henceforth with regards to Trek. So, <laughs> just interesting path we followed there. But I'm, the whole reason I went down that chain is to explain that all of that was completely unknowable to the mind of Leonard Nimoy back in 68, wondering what the crap, and probably just really sick of this job and really wanting to get on with it. There's a reason Nimoy wrote that book, I Am Not Spock, and then later corrected that with another book, I Am Spock. I haven't read both of those books in quite some time. I totally should reread them sometime. Anyways. So, yeah, Spock is regressing. <laughs> sure. Kirk then, you know, finds the critical exposition. If you stay in the past without being prepared, uh, then you die within a few hours. Remember that. That means it's only been a few hours for everyone in question. In fact, everyone seems to be falling on San Dimas time. Now, weirdly enough, that does kind of make sense. And I want to explain why. Because normally when you have time travel, you'd think, well, why not just go straight to the point you need to go? Like, when they come back, why don't they come back as soon as they leave, kind of a thing, like they did with the Guardian Forever? Well, the answer is because these machines are clearly designed to have a degree of two-way communication. Now, the only way to have two-way communication is to have a standard between the two, right? What I mean by that is, if it was like this, that might not work as well. But instead what we have is this. As both timelines are moving, both, you know, the information is being progressed across them. It almost has to be that way. Because otherwise, anything you try to say back in time doesn't go, goes forward at the improper rate because you yourself are not moving in time thanks to the time you're going back to. I'm saying this incredibly wrong. The point being, if there wasn't that, there would be no two-way communication possible. There, let me just say it that way. Now, I don't know why they wanted two-way communication. Maybe they used this for exploring or studying history. I don't know. Maybe they used it for scouting, so they could peek through, like, eh, and then peek back. But i got to say something. The whole you-have-to-be-prepared-to-go-through thing is kind of stupid, and only really exists for one reason, to ensure that Zarbata stays behind in the cold alone to die. Why? I mean, I appreciate a good tragedy as much as anyone else, but why the hell does she not get to come back to us with the fu to the future? There is no reason. This is, this is exactly like back in Plato's Stepchildren, except if Alexander didn't get to come with us. This is a woman tortured and uh, unfairly accused and basically put into this horrific situation by an evil tyrant. And, okay, enjoy your punishment. Bye. Bye. There is no reason for the plot or the structure of this episode to be designed in a way that she has to stay behind. There's no reason people couldn't come back with them. None. Now, that being said, <laughs> I do have to mention one thing. An idea that occurred to me is maybe they want to prevent people from being able to come back and forth. I'm not sure why they'd want that. That would be incredibly stupid to design a one-way time travel portal. But let's assume that's the reasoning. Okay, so just make it so that you can't go back at all. If you really want to make sure that they can't come back through, and they will die if they do so, just make it a one-way time portal. Now, obviously, that doesn't work for the point of the episode. I mean in character, in lore. If the people are designing it this way for that reason, then just make it one way. Oh, my God. Uh, so there's this bit where Spock, Spock, excuse me, Kirk is knocked out. Dun, dun, dun. It's okay, he immediately escapes as soon as the scene comes back to him. Let me talk about the Spock thing for a second. Now, I really liked the Spock romance in this side of Paradise. I thought it was one of the better parts of the episode. Here it's terrible. And I want to explain why I feel that way. Spock regressing emotionally is really stupid for reasons I don't even feel the need to expound upon. If, if you suddenly put me 5,000 years ago, I'm not going to suddenly turn into a whatever. Granted, 5,000 years ago, we were I, I don't know what humans were like back then, but you get the point, right? I'm not going to suddenly lose the ability to understand what a computer is, because I'm in the past. 
It doesn't work there. There's no groove waves going on the international wave whale network in order to try and force me to acclimating to the time period. So the idea that, Vol that Spock goes back to being like, kill, is nonsensical to me. This is ignoring the fact that all of his, his oh, he has those emotions. As is previously established, Spock has plenty of emotion. He just controls it. So all that should be happening is she, he should have maybe a more difficult job controlling it, but he is still controlling it nonetheless because he's used to those emotions that are already there. Then there's the fact that he falls desperately in love with this woman. Why? Is it be it's the fur bikini, isn't it? It's the fur bikini. Yeah, okay, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Gotta have the fur bikini. You know what irritates me most about this? Her falling in love with him instantly makes perfect sense. First of all, that's Leonard Nimoy in his prime. Second of all, this is the first person she's interacted with in however long. Of course she's going to immediately just be like, <gasps> and just cling to him as hard as she possibly can. She might not even like him long term. But who cares? It's someone else, right? Th then McCoy has this weird scene where he confronts them by insisting that she's lying, and I was expecting, remember, I don't really remember this episode, I was expecting this to lead to a moment where she's like, no, I know anyone else can go back. And I was expecting her to admit that she knew they could go back and had to or else they'd die, remember, several hours? And that was just incredibly morbid that she was so desperate for companionship that she was willing to keep them here against their will for a few hours just to have someone to talk to before they inevitably die. But no, instead she's just unaware of any of this. And why would she be? It doesn't actually make any sense for her to be fully aware of this because she was just someone who was sentenced here as part of this prisoner thing. She probably doesn't know exactly how this machine works. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up, imagine if they hadn't decided to go back. Just picture that. Remember, hours. So they're hanging out. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and like the next day rolls around and they're like, <gasps> and then they die. God, imagine what that would be like for Zarbadeth. Yeah. Zarabeth. Excuse me. Zarabeth. There's no D in there. Zarabeth. Who's Zarabeth? I think that's actually a character now I'm thinking about it. Anyone recognize that name? Zarabeth? Anyway, Zarabeth would probably be really traumatized. I finally found someone. No, they died. God, that would be tragedy. Holy crap. No, instead she has to stay behind because reasons. And then Q shows up and says, oh, this is stupid, and just snaps her to the present. And she escapes on the ship. And that's, that's happening. I don't even care anymore. I don't even care. She gets to go have a life that isn't on that stupid frozen ball. <sighs> and then they barely escape in time the end. I've got to give the remaster credit. The Nova, well, the scale is completely wrong. The Nova slowly expanding and engulfing the planet is a good visual. And it does kind of accent, well, the tragedy of this whole thing. Because this is a tragedy. This is a thinker, if it wasn't obvious. There's not really a threat. And there's no particular dilemma to be solved. And it's not really a character piece. And so forth and so on. There's no mystery. The mystery is solved within, like, a minute or three. No, this is a thinker. And, like I said, those people are now extinct. Because even though those people managed to escape into the past, they then lived out their lives and died. Their species has terminated at this point when their planet is destroyed by the Nova. That's a horrible thought. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost there. Um, was there any finals? Hang on, let me check my notes. I don't think so. There's no finals here that I'm aware of. So, yeah, next episode, last episode. Let's do this.